talking about cyber safety, you know, um, we used to always talk about cybersecurity, but it, because of the growing convergence of physical and cyber technologies, it really is becoming a safety issue in 2022, has, has been for a decade or more at least, but it's becoming more obvious. Uh, I already had a nice introduction, so you don't need this one, uh, except for maybe this kind of little organization. We're going to start out with a, a short talk about cyber threats, although Bob already gave me a big lead in, so I don't have to spend too much time on that. Uh, then we'll go to home security hygiene, and then we'll um, get some information on cybersecurity for children. Now, you can tell from my career that I've spent it in uh, global companies and academia, so the cybersecurity for children material is um, by courtesy of the information um, System Security Consortium, which is a certification organization, and they have a research center that focuses on children. So we are getting uh, the best advice on that topic, even if I didn't write it. You'll see the slide colors change. Yeah. So cyber threats used to be some uh, kids sitting in a basement, you know, hacking into uh, the school to change their grades or playing video games on AT&T's computer. Uh, that's the way we used to see them. And, you know, the, the movie War Games, that was by accident that the kids set off a, uh, a global nuclear, nuclear war. But um, right now, uh, what is happening and has been happening for at least the last decade or more is that this this is really a fiction. There are very few lone wolves out there in cybersecurity anymore compared to the number of the actual professional dangerous adversaries that are really focusing on organizing themselves into large uh, yeah, um, groups of special skills. So you think of like what's going on with the Terminator. That's just one little person out there, you know, one little actor in this much larger nation state that is threatening uh, the, the globe. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happening with the dangerous adversaries today. They are organizing into companies and uh, consortiums and helping each other to do things like take uh, your identity, sell it on the black market, um, farm for different information about an identity so that they can create complete profiles and really uh, become you on the internet. Okay. So they don't, you can see from this survey result that they, the people who are targeted are from all income levels, all slices of life. The attackers just, um, it, it used to be that, you know, they would attack specific uh, people or groups or organizations, but now it's like drive-by uh, um, shooting. You know, anybody in their path is game for some kind of marketplace that they can sell their information somewhere. And the people whose information is stolen rarely get back their identity in such a way that they are not paying for it in some way. Uh, if the money wasn't taken right out of their bank account, then um, maybe there's a loan out in their name and some bank is coming after them because they think that they're being swindled by a perfectly innocent person whose identity was stolen. And so what you have to know about this is that if you don't protect yourself, you will eventually be one of those percentages you know, that, that end up getting some kind of negative impact, even if it's just uh, your... Um, your Venmo transfer that was supposed to go to your friend, it'll go to some, uh, you know, anonymous adversary pretending to be your friend and you'll never see it. You'll, you'll never get that money back. The way they do this is they create, they collect these credentials and then they try to build profiles, as I've said. And I found this great site that uh, I think really illustrates the point. It says, have I been cloned? That's a, a term that hackers use to uh, talk about uh, the people who have been hacked. So in this site, you just put your email in and you say, you know, have I been phoned? And it comes up with all of the large data breaches where personal data was dumped or for sale on the internet, where this email address, my email address was in it, right? So if they can get some uh, subset of my data from any one of these downloads that 
and where hackers are buying and selling LinkedIn, right? I have a, some information on LinkedIn, at least where I work and what I've been doing, but the more sites that they've, that you're identified as being part of that data theft, the bigger and bigger uh, the information about you grows. And then you become one of the profile targets and then they go specifically looking for something like, oh, well, we don't have the zip code for that person or we don't have the social security number for that person. And they've got ways to get those, those little pieces of data that may not have just come out of the strainer. So uh, if that doesn't motivate you, then, I mean, I think everybody here is motivated because they're, they're listening to the topic. So just wanted to say something about the threats. So the number one thing that we do to try to protect ourselves is to control the access to our accounts ourselves. It's what we mean by controlling access, access control. We are the only ones who should be able to access our accounts. And accounts are set up supposedly so that you're the only one that knows your password. Not even your bank knows your password. Only you know your password. They can't share it. It's yours. And that's why you end up being liable for anything that you supposedly control. So how do you normally control that? Well, you control these things with passwords. And these are some ways that you can try to figure out what passwords are stronger than others. And in this uh, password meter site, if you have the word password for a password, it'll tell you that your average hacker who has methods of decrypting your password after they've found it in one of those big data troll sites, it, they might find it encrypted. They might find thousands of passwords encrypted, and then they just run computers trying to trying to crack, crack, crack until they find them. So the word password that I just put in is a very weak password, and they can crack that in less than a second. If you do things like put numbers in your passwords, like password, yeah, and uh, then oh, now it's cre creeping up. It's almost you know, it's it's over a minute, right? If you put special characters in your passwords, it's getting higher, right? And if you uh, have combinations of numbers, upper and lower characters, and you start making it long, you're getting passwords that are very strong. So think about that when you're choosing a password. The problem with that, and there's another password cracking link here that has more information about what those combinations are. And, and you know there's a problem with that. Everybody knows there, there's a problem with that. The problem is you can't remember those passwords. So I'm gonna tell you how you can remember those passwords. For accounts that are at banks or somewhere where you spend a lot of money and you've got an account and it would uh, uh, be very hard for you to recover if that account was uh, compromised. And you try to think of something that reminds you of the account, but also amuses you, makes you smile. You like to think about that password. If you choose difficult passwords that are hard, you know, you know about uh, some maybe based on some song you know that is sad or annoying, <laughs> you're not going to be as happy when you remember that password. You want to reward yourself when you remember the password. So, um, the, one of the ways my group of sisters here and I. Uh, what makes us smile is we like to shop for clothes at Talbot's, right? So if I'm gonna start with that phrase and come up with a very hard password, I can take special characters, I can take numbers and signs and write my little sentence, I like to shop for clothes at Talbot's. And then if I take this password and I put it in one of my meters here, I've got a 21st, I've got something that's 21 centuries to crack my password, right? It takes a very strong computer to do that. So that's the way you come up with things that you like and, but you can still remember, right? So that's what I recommend as a way to think about, is my slideshow, okay. For unimportant accounts, you may not have to go that far. You know, you still have to stop and think about that password. And if, if it gets compromised, you'll still have to take a new one. So it is a little effort to do that. It's okay to have a repeatable pattern if you can still make it unique in some way that would thwart an automated takeover. So for example, your newspaper recipe sharing site may have the same base, 
reading news can be a challenge and uh, reading recipes can be fun. Now, both of those are hard passwords. And if you put them in this site, you're going to get uh, a, a pretty good reading. 27 years, it's not centuries, but if it did get compromised, you're not, you don't really have all that much at risk, as long as this pattern has nothing to do with your bank account. So that's, that's the way to think about a risk-based approach to passwords. And also for any financial and even, even the New York Times, if it's easy enough, I would use multi-factor authentication. That way you just know that it's a little extra hard for a hacker to get into your account. Multi-factor authentication is, of course, when you have something on your phone or you've got a little token in your hand that has a, an extra uh, string that you would need to enter and it changes all the time. So it's usually a one-time token. They call it multi-factor authentication. Now, I come back to financial identity because this is how people lose their life savings when, when they have identity theft. Uh, identity thieves file false tax returns in their name, they steal their social security checks, they apply for credit, they take out mortgages and car loans. And the, there are online accounts that they exploit to do that, that are available to you to claim, but you may not know about it. And they do. And so they will log into the IRS, log into social security. And you have an account at those places, but you might not ever have gone there to claim it. So go claim it, go claim it now. Go to the IRS and register for a PIN, which is a, a personal identification number that has to go on your tax return. And if a tax return goes in your name without this PIN, then it won't be processed. So just go claim that PIN so that nobody can file a tax return but you and keep that a secret and make it um, uh, something that is just part of your, your regular routine with your accountant. Register with the social security, go to ssa.gov and sign up for an account. And then you will have that account and no one else will be able to divert your benefits or, or act as you at the social security site. Freeze your credit reports. People who are trying to apply for a loan need a credit rating. If a bank or a, a credit card company cannot get your credit rating, they will not give you credit. So make sure the thieves can't get your credit rating in, in your name. Log into these places, claim your uh, uh, credit account, and then freeze it. Tell those places that you're not borrowing any money and they are not allowed to let your credit rating go. And then if you do want to apply for a loan, you can always unlift that freeze for a day or two or you know, applying for a credit card, you can unlift that freeze for a day or two, but then at least in the meantime, nobody else is using that to get loans in your name. Avoid peer-to-peer -peer money transfers like Venmo and Zelle. I already used Venmo as an example. Zelle is another example. All they need is a, is a phone number. They need to fool you into sending um, uh, funds to a phone number. And fraudsters can actually um, register in Zelle with somebody else's phone number as long as it's not being used. And so just the fact that your grandmother's phone number is what you're transferring to in Zelle does not mean your grandmother owns the account, the bank account on the other side of that transaction. Be very careful if you're going to use these services, because whatever you authorize, you have authorized when you were logged in, you don't get that money back. You don't get it back, even if it was a fraudster on the other side of the transaction, because you authorized it. So because that two-factor authentication goes to your phone, and because so many of your passwords are traveling through your phone, and because your phone... Um, You're over there? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Question? Okay. Just shout out uh, if uh, you have a question. I don't see the, uh, the hands because I've got the screen up. <laughs> now, there are a lot of ways to protect your phone. And the first one is to make sure you don't have things in your phone that the hackers know about that, that you don't. So if there are applications that you installed one time and you never use, just delete them. If there are applications that somehow got in your phone, you don't know how, 
and you're not using them, delete them. If you do get a recommendation for some great new phone app, make sure you do some independent research to make sure what it is. Don't just say, take advice from a friend, oh, they like it, so you're going to like it. Don't start using it until you've actually vetted it somehow to understand that it is not a hacking tool and it doesn't have a history of being exploited. Activate those My Phone features. Every phone model has one. Apple might be the more um, famous because it was the first, Find My iPhone, but other models of phones have this Find My iPhone feature so that if you lose your phone and location services are turned on and this feature is enabled, you can get it back if you can find it. But if you, if you don't have this feature enabled, you don't have a chance really. Finding the location services on your phone um, allows you actually to selectively use the location services for Find My iPhone and maybe for Maps, but no, well, other apps don't really need the location services to provide the, uh, anything to you but advertising. So just turn them all off. Unless you really know what you're using location services for, this is a way for hackers to track you. The most common phone um, uh, criminal activity uh, at the beginning of cell phones and location services was just for people to go to your house when you were not home and rob you because they knew you weren't there. That still happens all the time. So location services is really dangerous. And also, if you have a, uh, you know, any kind of X you're trying to avoid or um, uh, any anything going on um, that you want to stay private or, or have your location unknown, the phone is the easiest way to get to you. Deactivate geolocation services from photos, by the way, because in the photo, if it's got the latitude and longitude of where you are, criminals know when you're on vacation, so they know your home is empty. So deactivate those features. Be on the lookout for any kind of people who are sending you texts, emails, of course, too, but texts from strangers, filter them out. These phones have ways to filter unknown senders or block unknown senders. You can erase these texts without clicking on them, but putting them in some kind of bucket, a block or a filter, means you don't even have to see them. If, if somebody's not in your contacts and they're trying to text you, they will call you or they will somehow communicate with you to say, hey, you're not getting my text, and then you can put them in your contacts. Your phone has a serial number, just like uh, any other piece of equipment that's important in your house, and a model number. So if you keep that and you do lose it, and you can produce that, if, if it shows up in any police station across the country, you'll get it back. If you do lose it and you don't get it back, use your fine, well, you can try to get it back first. <laughs> you can try and call it and see if somebody nice will pick it up and send it back to you, which actually happened to me once. If not, call your service provider, turn it off, have the phone wiped, change all your passwords, report it to police. Even if you get it back, change all your passwords because they could have read the disk on your phone and taken the data that includes password strings out, decrypted it because they'll have all the time and computing power to, to decrypt it. And then um, you will lose those accounts. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe a couple of weeks from now if you don't change your passwords. So. That's phone hygiene, but computer security hygiene is really the, the big target in your house. So everything that applies to the phone applies to computers. Remove all programs you don't use from your start so that you don't click on them by accident. So um, you know, you're not using things that are vulnerable that you don't understand. This is Windows 11. I don't know how many of you upgraded to it, but you've got it. Microsoft is now flooding you with stuff you don't use and you don't want. They're trying to put advertising and weather and everything in front of you. Just right click and say, take it away. I don't use Xbox. I, I don't want it in my start menu. I, I only want the, the programs that I actually use. So uh, try to um, clear your phone, your, your, your computer of things that may be dangerous. There is uh, software updates for security every week, literally on every operating system. Uh, that's a major operating system. I see all the alerts go by, uh, whether I own the software or not. And if you don't automate updating those, you will not ever be able to stay on top of the latest threat. Because as soon as there is a huge, uh, what we call a zero day uh, uh, threat, which means nobody knows about it yet, not even the manufacturer, it gets published. The manufacturer tries to get that feature out to to block the threat as soon as possible but in the meantime 
people are quoned, you know, that all their data is stolen, their passwords are stolen. So the only way to keep up with it is the auto update. There are operating system security features. Your computer has a hard password, use it. Otherwise, if somebody does somehow get into your operating system, uh, they can take your password and configure your computer to be accessed remotely, perhaps, and just use your computer as you. And there's um, uh, something called Bitcoin mining, which is uh, a common way that hackers try to take over your computer, use it to um, mine Bitcoin. And all you know is that your computer is getting really slow. And I've seen people throw their computer out because they couldn't figure it out. And it was really just a hacker using their system. So consider password protecting files that have personal information. If you're familiar with a program like WinZip, you can put that on your computer. You can put all of your financial information into it. And then every time you go in there, you'll have an extra password over and above your operating system features. So um, password protect your wireless network at home with a strong password. If you are in a hotel, try not to use those wireless networks. You know, people, um, Think they're safe using a VPN when they're on a guest wireless network, the VPN itself could be hacked. There are fake VPNs out there that advertise they're going to give you security and all they do is sell your data. So if you don't know what you're doing, it might be the right thing to do to buy a wireless hotspot, which is like a, uh, a wireless network that looks like the size of a phone but it actually lets you into the internet at very high speeds and you can connect multiple computers to it if you're traveling and then um, if you're home and you've got your wireless hotspot, you could use it as a wireless for your guests. So then you don't even need to let your guests on your own home Wi-Fi. Record all device serial model numbers of your computers, just like your phones. That's the only chance you'll get it back if it ends up in a police station in some other city. And set all your browser security features to the highest possible level, unless you really know what you're doing. These companies have been fighting on the front lines of the cyber wars forever because the browsers is, is the battleground where the hackers try to um, attack personal uh, you know, information on, on unsuspecting consumers and browser and um, you know, web users. So these, these browser companies have spent decades trying to create security and privacy settings that will be industry standard and they can enforce. And if you ignore their warnings, it's at your own peril, unless you really, really know what they're doing. You're doing, I would set them all to the highest level possible. So we have, in addition to identity theft, the other biggest threat that we have to the home and to businesses, by the way, is ransomware. If you're not familiar with ransomware, I can tell you it means that somebody will destroy all the data in, on your computer. They will encrypt it all and they'll say, oh, I'll sell you the key to get it back. But it doesn't mean that you'll actually get it back because there are a lot of ransomware operators that just encrypt all the data on your computer, ask you for the money, you send it to them anonymously, and they just let your computer die. They don't ever decrypt it. So you don't know what kind of criminal you, you, you're up against, one that's going to. Um, decrypt it or one that doesn't even know how to decrypt because they're just, you know, taking advantage of the fact that people think that if they encrypt data uh, and charge uh, that they will decrypt it for you. How do most people get infected with ransomware? By clicking on an email from somebody that you don't know that are <laughs> that that is um, malicious. Uh, these criminals are getting more and more sophisticated. It used to be that you know, there was filled with misspellings. Now they look like friendly advice or a neighbor or maybe a gardener you had once, but um, they're, they're getting much more sophisticated. So if you are not 100% sure and you think you know who sent you something, then call or text that person and find out, but don't click on anything in the email. Just, and if possible, just delete all the email from people you don't know. If somebody really needs to get to you, they eventually will. Um, if you decide an email is suspicious, as again, just um, you know, don't even look at it, not even for curiosity's sake. Uh, it, it's too dangerous. <laughs> so keeping a, a backup in a cloud service is a good idea because if, if ransomware does hit your machine or for any other reason you lose your data, um, you don't want uh, to be without like your favorite photos or uh, you know all of your bank statements for the last whatever you've got in your computer, you know your correspondence with your friends. 
a backup should be somewhere else other than the computer, not just another file on the computer, but in a fireproof safe or in a cloud environment. And if you are on a Microsoft machine every day, you don't want to be using the Microsoft cloud as your backup because if Microsoft is hacked, you will lose that resiliency that you would have had from a backup and you know they could they could get both you and your backup at the same time so be diverse you know take a, a, a dropbox or an, or an apple um, uh, backup if you are on microsoft and if you have a macintosh maybe you want your um, backup on microsoft something like that but find a way to put your the data that you want to keep in a couple of places and as fireproof safe, you know, maybe once a month is not a bad idea if you're syncing it every day somewhere else. Now, you, believe it or not, all of the preceding material applies to your children, except for maybe the IRS. I don't know how many children's tax returns have been filed, um, but uh, the, um, the, the debt, uh, you know, the applying for mortgages and credit cards and buying cars in a child's name works in a lot of places. Credit card companies are coming after young adults because they believe that they've got a 10 year history of uh, abusing credit when they've never applied for a card. And the first time they find out is because they applied for a card. So we'll talk more um, later about how to keep your kids safe on the net, but you have to know that they are a huge threat financially, that the FTC is just full of, um, stories and also advice on how to protect your child from identity theft. So really think about that. Uh, it's very difficult for a young person who's, you know, just used to thinking the internet is a free and fun place to share data to all of a sudden be a huge victim of it. Then we have the other reason that we need to protect our children is because there's a lot of child predators out there and they roam the internet looking for kids. And the FBI is really up on this. They have um, cyber alerts for parents. I encourage you to go to these links if you want to learn more about, you know, what uh, what the tools and tactics and procedures are for some of these criminals, and and they'll have alerts about the new criminals and what they're doing and what sites that they are frequently uh, looking for children on. And they also have an app, which if you put in, if you put it on your phone, and you put in a bunch of details that they have predefined about your child, then if your child does disappear, then you can, in, in, a, in an instant, get that information to the FBI so that they can run it through their computers and look for um, evidence you know, that relates to your child. So it's a good idea to spend a little time in advance to keep that updated, maybe update it once a year, put a new picture in, and uh, know that you've got uh, that electronically stored record that the FBI will use if they need to look for your child. And here we are moving into the things that the Safe and Secure Online Center for Cybersecurity, uh, Safety and Education um, advise after you know their own research and they've been doing this for decades and they um, have provided these materials to their members in this organization, ISC Squared so that we can share it with you. One of the things you have to do is always have open and honest conversations with your kids. They need to know that what they put online, you can see. Not only you can see it, it'll be there forever. So if you can't see it today, you'll probably be able to see it sometime soon. So there's no point in trying to hide anything on the internet from you or anyone else. They're not gonna be able to uh, hide it from a, um, uh, academic uh, administration team that's looking, you know, uh, ad looking to admit them to a college, they're not going to be able to hide it from uh, their friends, like if they're, you know, bullying some friends, the other friends will find out. Um, and the, the only solution to, you know, not being embarrassed on the internet is to, you know, treat others the way you would want to be treated, you know, the, um, the old adage, uh, uh, Somebody will have to quote it for me. <laughs> but you, you really need to impress upon them that there is no hiding, you know? It used to be on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. That was the big cartoon that everybody liked. Now on the internet, everybody knows you're a dog, right? <laughs> and whatever you've done will follow you forever. So what do you do specifically as a parent? Well, what you wanna do is have 
agreements with your children so that they know when um, it, they are allowed to be on the internet and when they are not limit their screen time. If you allow them to be on there all the time, then they will become addicted and they will um, be hiding things from you, whether you have a trustful relationship with them or not. It is just the nature of the way that the programs on the internet and the, um, the predators on the internet interact psychologically with your children. And they are children, so they can't really think logically and, and enough to protect themselves from this kind of brain manipulation. Make sure that every time they're on the internet, there is a open way for you to see that screen. Even if you're not looking at it all the time, you could walk by any minute and see what they've got. Keep the devices somewhere where you know where they're being used or they're not, you know, maybe a central charging station and may many devices can be set up. So the child's account can't be used to do things like download a new application. So at least you know whenever a, um, a child will install a new app and you can talk about it and decide whether they need it or not. And then always set up those device controls before giving it to your child. Once the children figure out, no, oh, I can download any app I want, then, they, then it becomes a battle. But if you take the proactive approach and say, this is how we do things, this is what the computer is, and this is what you can do with it, then you'll get a much better um, uh, cooperation response. Now, at the, at, the, at the one extreme, for even greater control, and I would definitely do this, when you get the device, create your child's online passwords so that they can't go onto Facebook unless you know they're on Facebook, at least especially when they're young, until they've actually demonstrated that they are responsible online. You can actually just, you know, allow them two hours a day, log in for whenever they want to, don't let them see the password when you're typing, and then follow them so that you can see what they post and you know which apps that they're on. If you find evidence that, you know, they're on different apps or they figured out how to download something, that's a conversation. And that conversation can be made easier by talking about what they are and are allowed to do in advance. And the uh, Safe and Secure Online uh, organization has drafted up some sample contracts, parent-child internet contract. What is my responsibility as a child to be responsible on the internet so that I don't embarrass myself and my family or, or, or end up my, you know, God forbid, being abducted and, and having my, um, you know, mother have to grieve for me, right? These are the things I need to do. And then the parent responsibilities are that I will be open, I will talk about what, what we're doing, I will negotiate, you know, what, what they would like to do, and we will discuss it. And if, um, if, a child does meet a stranger online and, and really, really wants to meet them, I will commit to talking to them about it. I'll keep an open mind, but we're probably not gonna go that way. <laughs> and at least then you know that you'll have this conversation or at least you have the commitment to have the conversation. You both sign it as if it's a contract. It might be the first contract that kid has ever seen, but it will help them take the agreement more seriously because they will remember that they agreed to something because they post it on the, on the wall or something so that you can point to it at any time. Now, so one at a time, you know, when they go into different apps, there are different hazards and different apps. Chat rooms and sextings are a really big, big problem. I uh, would not let kids use chat rooms at all um, because uh, that's where the anonymous people hang out trying to talk to them. If there is one that their classmates use, you should visit it often and make sure that, that the conversations on the up and up always be in their groups. Um, the, uh, the kids do hide them. You know, this is a, a picture of what we have seen. And uh, what is the scary part is that even after all your agreements, they could be hiding that device when they're not supposed to be using it, which is the reason why you need to keep it in some um, centralized place where you can see where it is. It's, uh, it's just the nature of being manipulated that um, these kids will do that. It is not that your kid is bad. It is that you need to protect them. Cyberbullying, speaking of protecting, you know, your kid could be a cyber bully or they could be being bullied, one or the other. Either one is gonna affect their, their lives forever. 
if they are bullied, these are the common symptoms that you find, anger, depression. They might just give up their device. They might stop the, the, their favorite apps or games because there are people who are bullying them on them. They might not wanna to go to school and they might be withdrawn in general because they just feel inadequate and depressed. And if this is happening, then you should suspect their internet behavior. You should suspect it. You should double up your efforts to supervise and monitor and find out what's going on so that you can address it and maybe bring it into the school if you have to. But you have to be proactive about this. They will not tell you. And it used to be that games on the internet were things like solitaire or ping. You know, they're very fun, easy to, to manipulate games. And now they're violent as anything. They're, they're murder and sex and um, strain, playing with strangers and killing each other. And it desensitizes children to violence. Many of the uh, mass shootings by children have, or you know, teenagers or whatever, these people have a history of, of living in these games and spending so much time in it, they think it's normal. And they want to see it in the real world. And they and act, they act it out. This is what is happening. So if your child is doing this, you're increasing the chances that they will be a violent adult. So as part of that contract, you might want to say no, no violence in uh, where human lives are being taken in any game that you play. And again, everything that applies to adults applies to children, even more so when it comes to posted photos. You know, your school, you know, people often do selfies and then their school is right behind them. So the people on the internet know where they go to school. They will go to that school and drive by it looking for that kid. They do, they do that. Um, they, uh, kids will post when their parents aren't home and, um, and uh, that is dangerous as well. Just remember that if, if your child has a phone, take the geotagging off of the photos. Um, of course, like I said, you, you can just, they can still take pictures by accident, but you can discuss that with them and, and also monitor their photos and give them feedback in real time when that happens. So we have a whirlwind. I haven't had one question, so I assume you're following all this. That's why we're gonna make the slides available so you can go back and click and read later, you know, something that interested you here and there. But I find that if you're really interested in cybersecurity, maybe you want to know a little bit more about it in the genre that you are most comfortable with. So I put together a couple of different books that I like from uh, my experience in reading different types of genre. And, you know, this is just a small sample, but I, I pick some things that, you know, if you're into science fiction and you want to learn about cybersecurity, that Ghost Fleet book is really, really cool. Um, if you just want to learn about how the nation is trying to protect themselves, you might want to try cyber attacks. Um, if, you, if you really want to be scared uh, about the cyber war and what's going on in Ukraine, read this book by Nicole Perlroth and, um, you know, a couple of other suggestions for you. And I'm happy to come up with others if people have questions or, you know, comments.